Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Stan Spinner, and I'm from Texas Children's Pediatrics and Texas Children's Urgent Care. And I'm very excited to be here today to talk with you about uh, the journey that Texas Children's Pediatrics has had in improving our HPV vaccination rates. I am Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Texas Children's Pediatrics and Texas Children's Urgent Care. Just uh, briefly to tell you a little bit about Texas Children's Pediatrics, we were established back in 1995. Initially, the, uh, system, the hospital system purchased uh, several existing practices and then added uh, new practices as well. Uh, we've rapidly grown and today are the largest pediatric primary care organization in the United States, employing over 300 uh, pediatricians uh, with 61 primary care locations. 50 of those locations are in the greater Houston area with 11 locations in Austin and with plans on expanding to a few more sites in Austin as well. We also have 12 urgent care sites. We have 11 in the Houston area, eight are in the community, three are situated on our three Texas Children's Hospital campuses in Houston. We also have one location in Austin. So let's talk about HPV vaccine. And the first thing I wanted to kind of discuss is why was the original plan to introduce HPV vaccine starting at age 11? Why not at an older age? Well, we were able to determine and understand very early on that um, there is an improved immune response for our younger uh, adolescents when, they, when they're vaccinated rather than waiting until they're older. And also, if you complete the series prior to age 15, only two doses of the vaccine are necessary versus three doses if you complete the series after age 15. We also know that our younger adolescents have very long lasting protection from the vaccine. And we also wanna be sure that our, uh, our adolescents are protected with the full completion of the series prior to any uh, sexual activity. So as we started to look at uh, completion rates uh, and the completion rate at age 13 has been kind of a national metric, it's a HEDIS measure. As, as we looked at that, we saw that we are just, you know, not being very successful at getting uh, those completion rates uh, where, where they need to be. And I don't think that's unique for us. I think that that's a, a national challenge. So we had looked at our overall Texas Children's Pediatrics uh, visit rates for adolescents coming in for, for well checks. And this data is from a few years ago, but it's still very much the same today. And we could see, and as you can look at the slide here, a very sharp decline in visits really after age 12. And I think that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, he just uses that uh, completion rate by 13 as a metric, because we know that as our adolescents get older, they generally just don't come back to their pediatricians anymore. By and large, most of them are healthy. And so they just, uh, their families don't see a need for them to come in to, to see the doctor unless they're sick. So that's a real, uh, real, one of the major reasons why there's been a challenge in getting our patients completed. You know, they come in at age 11 in the state of Texas. Uh, it's a requirement for school to have the, uh, the uh, Tdap, the tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis vaccine and the meningococcal vaccine given. So they're coming in at the 11 year old visit and mostly at the 12 year old visit. But again, after that, the visit rates really drop off. And we know that a lot of our patients really are not fully protected uh, once they're potentially exposed to HPV because of that. So about two and a half years ago, I started thinking, what can we do to improve not only our initiation, but more importantly, our completion rate by age 13? And I realized that, you know, the, the ACIP and the AAP do recommend uh, starting HPV at age 11 to 12, but you can start it as, a, as early as age nine. And when we started looking at data from, you know, our completion rates by age of giving that first dose, uh, you can see that uh, the completion rate, if you started at age nine or 10, uh, is, is extremely high. And even starting at age 11, it really starts to drop off at 12 and really starts to decline beyond that. So again, start to think, why are we waiting till age 11 to recommend this vaccine when we can do it you know, much sooner? Um, and so even though the official recommendation is to start HPV at age 11, uh, the ACIP and the American Academy of Pediatrics do have as an option to start uh, the vaccination as early as age nine. And I think one of the primary reasons why the initial recommendation was to, to start at age 11, it was because it was being bundled along with the uh, Tdap and the meningococcal vaccine. So all three vaccines 
would be you know, recommended and given at the same time. But I think we found that a lot of families really prefer not having to give their, their kiddos that many shots at one time. So separating it out to you know, less shots at, at a particular visit actually was, was a helpful thing. We also know that for our organization, we got about 125,000 patients through age 19 that have only received one dose of HPV vaccine. Uh, we don't know the efficacy of one dose. Uh, we do know the efficacy of the two dose completed series is extremely high, uh, but we're, we really don't know how the, the efficacious just giving one dose is. But clearly there is, is, there is a, a, an, an issue with that. And the other thing about starting it, at least introducing the concept of giving the vaccine at age nine is it gives us more time to get that vaccine completed. So even if we don't give the dose at age nine, if we at least have that conversation, uh, with the uh, parent, then they could uh, read about it and talk with their uh, spouse if that's the case. And then when they come back for their 10-year-old checkup, they can start the vaccine then. And even in the worst case scenario, at least be ready to start at age 11. Whereas if you only talk about it at age 11, often they're not ready to start at age 11. So, um, and we found that the families that said yes at age 11, said yes at age nine and said yes at age 10. So it really made sense to go ahead and introduce the concept starting at an earlier time. Again, increasing the, the opportunities to get the first and the second dose in. And another advantage uh, that we found is that if we get that first dose at age nine, we don't necessarily have to bring them back six months later for a nurse visit to give the second dose. They could just get it when they come in at their 10-year-old visit, which for the most part they're still doing, or even the 11-year-old visit, which they're definitely doing because of the state requirements. So it, it uh, alleviates the need for that, you know, for the family taking time away from work or taking a child out of school to, to drive in the, in the traffic that we have in Houston and Austin and come and do a nurse visit just for that second dose. It's done when they're going to be there for, for their next routine checkup. So what, you know, what did we do to kind of really build this into the system? So, you know, Texas Children's Pediatrics is part of uh, a system. We have, uh, you know, our, our primary care practices. We have ambulatory at the hospital. We also have Texas Children's Health Plan, which also sees patients. And then we also have um, an OB-GYN, uh, part of Texas Children's Hospital now is, is, is an OB-GYN hospital. So we, uh, and we see uh, adolescent uh, girls in the, in the gym clinic. So I went to all of our leaders and I said, I want this to be at a system level, not just for Texas Children's Pediatrics. Uh, and everyone bought into that. Uh, we've been able to use our electronic medical record, which we use EPIC. Uh, there's something called Forecaster, where our clinical staff, when patients come into the office, can just click into Forecaster, and it will show what vaccines are due based on the ACIP. Uh, we've, we've modified Forecaster to show that HPV vaccine will be due at starting at age nine. So our clinical staff can actually see that if a nine or 10-year-old comes into the office, if they haven't started, uh, that they are due to start or, or to complete that the HPV vaccine. We also modified our well child templates so that it's a default now to actually give the vaccine at age nine. So our physicians, rather than having to, you know, manually order things, a lot of it is kind of done and they have to then opt out. So of course, if the family uh, declines the vaccine at nine or 10 or at any time, or if the physician decides that they don't want to give the vaccine, they can just uncheck the box, but it makes it a lot easier for them to not only remember it, but to actually have it done for them by having that built right into uh, our, our well child template. Um, we've also used a lot of evidence-based strategies to really help to, you know, to get our families to, to know to come for the vaccine. We've had for some time a uh, reminder of automated reminder phone calls that we've used to remind families that their child is due a checkup. If they're a month past their due date, they would get a second call to let them know that they have missed uh, and it's time for them to schedule that visit. We also do that for, uh, for vaccinations. We've largely moved away now from phone calls and we're doing it by using uh, text messaging, uh, which is much more efficient and they can actually go directly into their MyChart and schedule that online. So again, it's really helpful for families to get that uh, text message reminding them that their uh, child is due for a well check or indeed their, their child is due for a vaccine uh, and go ahead and, and schedule that. Uh, with, largely done away with, uh, again, as, as I mentioned, the phone calls, uh, routine emails and letters and cards, uh, kind of a, an old fashioned way of doing it that we've stopped doing as well. We really use our MyChart portal to text messaging for, for these reminders. Uh, another major component that we've done is we use standing delegated orders. 
Um, and standing delegated orders are orders that are put together and there's a legal process for this um, so that um, orders can be there for our staff to can act on without the physician having to actually manually put the order in. Uh, our physicians have to agree to do these orders and it's kind of an all or none for any given practice so that uh, whether it's vaccines or maybe certain labs, things like that, um, if the patient meets the right conditions for that, the uh, nurse can go ahead or the, or the MA can go ahead and uh, initiate the vaccine even before the physician comes into the room. I think this is a huge advantage when families are roomed and there's a period of time when you're waiting for the physician to come in, the MA can let the family know that uh, the child was due uh, the HPV vaccine and certainly any other vaccine. And if the family says, yes, go ahead and just give the vaccine before the uh, physician comes in. I know when I was in my practice, walk in a room and an adolescent uh, had already been given their vaccinations. It was a whole different world of not that child's no longer worried, that child's no longer anxious. They know that they've been poked and the worst part of it's over. So it's a win-win situation being able to get those vaccines given ahead of time. Uh, and, and a lot of our MAs can give their own personal stories that, you know, my child's had the vaccine, my child's had HPV. It was, you know, it's the best thing that we've done to protect them from cancer. And again, starting it at age nine has really allowed us to kind of take the whole sexual activity conversation out of this. It is a cancer prevention vaccine. And that's what we have focused on with our staff, with our physicians, so that it really has, uh, I think, made it a lot easier conversation to have with our families. So with the different changes that we've done, both with the uh, reminders and certainly by initiating uh, the uh, vaccine as early as age nine, between uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, our HPV vaccination initiation rates increased from 20.8% to 29.7%. Our completion rate increased from 29.9% up to 33.6%. Now, these numbers are on the lower end because we're talking about all of our patients. If we talk about just patients that have been in, uh, um, our completion rates are over 50%. But these are the rates that we've looked at as a comparison. And again, we're very excited about the fact that we have really seen some significant improvement uh, during this time based on these changes that we initiated. And before I complete uh, my talk, I just want to mention one thing about COVID because I guess today nothing is complete without talking about COVID for the last 15 months. So when we really started shutting down last year back in March, the Academy of Pediatrics had recommended that uh, we really only limit uh, visits to well checks from birth to age two. I felt it was more important to bring kids in through age four. So we were seeing you know, children up to age four. We were at, um, really educating our families about the fact that we were trying to, you know, you know, we were remaining, you know, socially distant. We had no one in our waiting rooms. Families were being immediately roomed. Um, so we were, you know, keeping our immunization rates quite, quite, you know, quite up to where we were before the, uh, the uh, pandemic started through our, you know, with our younger kids. We're very excited about that. Um, we also, after a short period of time, uh, launched what we call car side immunization. So a lot of our practices, we had parking lots that would allow us to be able to have the family come and park in there, stay in the car, and we would come down and vaccinate them through, you know, through the uh, open window. And we were vaccinating our younger kids, we were vaccinating our adolescents. So by doing that in a robust way, even though we couldn't bring our adolescents in uh, through the early part of the pandemic into the office, we were able to vaccinate them in their cars. And again, we were able to maintain a very consistent rate of adolescent vaccine, probably not quite the same as the younger age group, but still, uh, very consistent, so we did not see that much of a diminution of our adolescent vaccination rates during this past year. Uh, we added flu vaccines in during, you know, when flu season started, and of course, over the last few months, as our PPE supplies have grown and our understanding of the spread of disease has has, has evolved, we've started bringing all, you know all of our patients back into the office. Our volumes are almost back up to where they were uh, pre-pandemic, but certainly we're bringing in our, our adolescents into the office. But even the few that still don't want to come in, we are still doing our, our car side vaccination. So that's still an option and will probably remain an option for some time for families for, for any of their vaccines. So again, this uh, concludes uh, my, my presentation and I'll be happy to take any uh, comments or questions. So thank you very much.